Fishing the DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. We are only 72 Patreon members away from achieving our next major milestone for $6 a month, which is less than a pack of Senkos or a jackham or chatterbait. You can help us achieve these goals. All Patreon members will receive 5% off all of their orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle, 10% off all their orders to Tiger Crankbaits, 10% off their order to Catoctin Rods, You'll also become a member of our private Facebook group community, be a part of our monthly photo contest giveaways, and of course, members only content. Check out the episode description down below. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Aarons, and today we're heading back to Smith Mountain Lake for a guy that came damn near close to hitting the dirty 30, Chris Brummett, 27 pounds, 9 ounces from Smith Mountain Lake. Um, my God, that place is turning out. I have no idea why we don't do bigger tournaments there, because if you had to put a gun to my head, Smith versus Kerr, I mean, Smith hands down right now. It's amazing. Chris, how you doing tonight? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing wonderful. Thanks for coming on. Um, I mean, how I start out most of these shows is just to tell us a little bit about yourself. Like, how did you get into this crazy sport? Yeah, so I uh, I always loved to pond fish, actually, when I was a kid. Uh, pond, creek, anything I could find to fish in, I would fish in it. And I have memories of going camping with my family. And I wouldn't come out of the creek the entire time we were there. I was catching mostly like just suckers and, and crazy stuff and just small little small fish but you know i loved every minute of it and uh definitely went to some ponds with my dad and when i was a kid i remember him tying a black lizard on at one particular pond and uh you know i i, I threw the lizard in after he tied it on and my first fish was a five pounder my next p- uh, fish was a three pounder and you know that was the only two fish we caught out of the pond that day but it was before he even got in the water at all to, to try to do any fishing and it's like fished them out fished the whole pond out really quickly it was just a little small pond we didn't even know if it was anything in it but you know i guess i was i was hooked early on uh and then for tournaments i i didn't really start tournament fishing until about 2014 time frame and wow. I got a I got a job to where I worked 14 hour days. I was off on Fridays, so I was able to to practice on Fridays. So that really started my my fishing. I I started doing a lot of practicing, and when I started catching about the same weights that it looked like everybody else was catching uh, to compete, I thought it was probably time to to jump into the competition side of things, and uh, was fortunate to where I won a boat actually at Smith mountain Lake, uh, in oh, cool. 2017. That was a, that was a pretty cool moment and just kind of, you know, been fishing ever since. There's a lot to unpack there. So how old were you when you fished your first tournament? Uh, in my, uh, the good question. I don't even know in my, in my twenties. Oh, wow. Um, okay. So a little bit later to the tournament yeah. scene. For sure. Yeah. I, I, you know, my growing up, my, my family, my, my grandpa and my dad had had boats, but they were mostly like runabout boats, not, not bass boats at all. And my parents next door neighbor, actually, he was going to move. He was a plant manager and he was moving with his company and he knew I liked to fish and he, he offered me a boat at a, a steal of a deal. It was a, a Skeeter with a, a 115 on it. And that was the first boat that I started playing around with. What, what tournament did you fish that you won a boat? Cause that that's old school, you know, being able to win a boat. Yeah, that was actually the big bass tour on Smith mountain Lake 2007. Oh, that is so freaking cool, dude. What was the size? Yeah. 781. Damn. That's so freaking cool. And that really like, it's not a regular tournament. If you guys don't know the big bass tour, it's a God, I don't even know how to explain the format. It's like every hour you have a chance to win. So you can catch one, bring it in every hour. Biggest fish of that hour kind of wins. And then I believe it's an overall for the day. Correct. Correct. Yep. Overall, overall biggest fish over the three days of the tournament. What did that do 
would you consider that up until this point in your life? Was that the biggest win that you had? For sure. Yeah, I, that was a uh, that was a pretty cool, a pretty cool deal, you know, and you, you win a boat with a cast and one fish and it that, that's that's a moment. That's one of those things you'll never forget. And it definitely was a huge win. Did you I think it's such a fascinating format. Like, do you practice differently for that? Or are you just tying on a, you know, a 15 inch glide bait and just hoping to hit pay dirt? I mean, how do you even get your mind around getting ready for that? So for myself, I move a lot. You know, I, I hit a lot of spots. Um, I, I've always said, and, and I believe this for the bigger weights, like any weight that you catch, I, I think you can practice to catch 18 pounds, maybe even 20 pounds. On anybody of water, well, I can't say anybody of water, but especially Smith Mountain, kind of locally, um, it's hard to practice to catch anything over 20 pounds. It just it's something that has to happen throughout the day. Yeah. Um, and the same with those big fish, you you can't practice to catch an eight pounder. It just it just some it's something that happens. You fish those spots that you know hold bigger fish, but I you won't catch me practicing those spots. I, I if I if I feel like those fish are on those types of spots, any spot, really the bigger fish, I, I will not practice those spots. Hmm. Yeah. Cause I've, I've had it so fascinating. Cause when you look at a tournament like that, every hour, it does seem like it's a completely different mindset, but the fact mm. that you won that, that, that had to have helped your confidence some, like what did that do to you? I feel like everyone needs that one win that kind of solidifies, like they don't suck. They can do this. Was that the win or was there something else that you could really stick out in your mind? Is like, this was the moment that made me really have confidence in myself. I would definitely say that was, that was the moment. I mean, you know, 2017 was, was, that was definitely the moment. I mean, you know, I, I I had I had friends already and you know when you when you win a boat and you catch a big fish like that and at the time a 781 was uh, a huge fish for Smith Mountain um was still a huge fish for Smith Mountain but you know at the time it was a really big fish and I caught it on the first day and waited in I think maybe the third hour and as soon as I waited in I had people text messaging me you know and telling me I was winning and I it was over and you know, you never want to believe you never want to believe it that early in the tournament. And and now with the way Smith is fishing, you really wouldn't want to believe it. But, you know, then I had a really good feeling about it. But, yeah, so that moment. And then, like I said, you have you have people that uh, start talking to you and, and, and guys that are that have been really good fishermen for a long time. You know, they they start to uh, talk to you. And the, I think fishing, the more people you can talk to the better off, you know, the better off you are. Um, you can take a little bit of knowledge away from each person you, you speak with. And you really felt like after that win, it kind of opened up those doors. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's that is so fascinating because it's within any sport, not just fishing. You have those moments that everyone around you, whether it's your peers or maybe yourself, that they start really taking a look at you and it really does change things. And it's, but it's so hard just to get to that first win. And back then, like seven pounds is crazy. Like what were the weights? I can't even like think far that far back. Like what were the weights generally speaking at Smith Mountain Lake back in 16, 17, 18 lower. Yeah. I mean, so there was one guy that came in the very last hour on that Sunday that challenged me. Uh, and he had, he, he also had a seven pounder, but I mean, even the year after that, it only took like a six and some change to win that year. Um, so the year after that one, but you know, back then in 17, you know, eight, 18 pound bags was a heck of a good bag on Smith. Wow. That's insane. And cause now here we are now where it seems like every year, this time of year, there's multiple bags in the twenties and 18, 19, that's probably getting you maybe top 10, hopefully. Uh, yep. it, it's, it's insane. Um, did you fish the first event this year? I guess the Piedmont division. You broke up on that one for a second, Thomas. Uh, the, uh, I heard some the, fishing in Piedmont Division. Yeah, the uh, Piedmont Division earlier this year. Did you fish in that one? I did fish that tournament. I sure did. I had um, I had sixteen pounds and some change. I actually uh, I actually drew a local for that tournament, and uh, I I won't say I held back a lot, but you know, it's it's some stuff you just cannot fish that that you don't want to lose when you when you do draw a local. 
that's actually a fun mental exercise. If you were on them in practice, would you still hold back? Like, like I don't know how you determine like if you feel like you're going to win, but but also like with a BFL, it's not paying you a hundred thousand dollars. So, yeah, yeah, that's interesting, huh? Yeah, uh, it's yeah. it's one of those. It's just one of those. I mean, I I, I fished I fished my style, um, but I certainly left a couple of things off that that I would have fished had it not been somebody that was a local. Well, what did you think of your performance in that tournament? Because this that would I'm assuming would be the impetus for this next one that we're talking to be talking about here shortly. Did you feel like you you executed pretty well? Um, I I felt I felt okay about that tournament. The the first tournament I I definitely left a few fish on the table and, and it, it was, it had nothing to do with my co-angler, my co-angler, Scotty Howard. I mean, he's a great co-angler. Um, he's, he's done very well fishing out of the back of the boat. He, he actually probably one of the best co's I've ever fished with. He may be the best co I ever fished with. I I'd be completely gone to another spot. He'd throw 20 miles behind the boat and he's like, Oh, there he is. I mean, he never caught a fish all day that I felt like, I would have, I would have caught because most of those areas I had already left them when he caught his fish. Um, so what I did, what, what I did to not, to not really capitalize on, on what I had is I had a couple of bites that I, I knew fish were in the back ends of pockets for that particular tournament. And I had a bait that I was throwing and I could actually burn it and watch the fish eat it. Um, so I was burning it back to the boat and a six pounder came up and smoked it. And I just, I, I totally lost my mind and I just missed the fish, just completely missed it. Um, so that, that, that one fish alone would have, would have put me up, you know, pushing the 20 pound mark just with that one fish. Um, and I had a couple of other missed opportunities similar to that throughout the day, but that that one was that one really hurt, you know, because I I knew that fish was in that area. I had seen it in practice, and it, it did the same thing in practice. But I had my hooks covered up. But for the tournament, I didn't have them covered up. I just couldn't put a hook in it. That's I'm glad you mentioned that because that's interesting. I, I, me and my friends argue about that so much about cutting hook, shaking fish off. What is your vibe with that in practice? Is it like on a Friday, cut all the hooks off, or just smoke them if you see them? Like like where do you land on that? You know, my my big thing for practice is I try to stay away from those fish as much as I can. I, I you know, on a Friday, I'm certainly not hooking anything I intend on catching during the tournament. Uh, if I catch one on a Friday, I pretty much know he's not going to bite on Sunday. So, I, I like to cover my hooks. Actually, is is one of the big things I do. I leave the hook on. I'll just cover it up, and uh, and 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 I'll fish my areas. I mean, and that's one of the things that I like to do. Maybe a Friday before is I'll cover my hooks completely. I'll go into my target area and I'll actually fish like I was fishing the tournament. Hmm. Um, and if I'm not, if I'm not, if, if I plan on setting the hook, I'll, I'll go to a completely different area of the lake Um, and, and fish something completely different and try to let it talk me into not fishing where I I really want to fish, not fishing my primary area and just doing something different. Are you ever worried that that would lead you astray because the voices in your head that let's say you do, you skip a jig underneath a dock and you do smoke a five and a half pounder, but it's not in the area you think you'd be fishing. Is it more of like, this is a good idea or like, oh shit, now I got to think about this tomorrow. It depends on, yeah, if it's at the complete opposite end of the lake, you know, you're like, uh oh, what's, what's going yeah. on? And, and, and I, I would have to, I would have to duplicate it again somewhere pretty close for me to, for me to vacate absolutely everything. But if, uh, you know, if, if you go to the, to the other end of the lake and, and the fish want to bite there and, and they seem to be good ones, then you would maybe vacate your, uh, maybe vacate your plan. But, you know, I, I think I'm, I'm, I used to be a really good practice fisherman. I used to catch a lot of fish in practice and <laughs> like. It, it used to be really fun for practice, and now I, I, I don't do that. I've, I've watched some of the better anglers that I've come to know, and they they tell me how terrible their practice is, and they end up catching them on tournament day. And I think something is to be said for that. You know, I catch my fish in practice. I'm not catching them during the tournament. But So 
I kind of I'm I'm a woe is me kind of practice guy now. I'll, I'll have horrible practices, and my tournaments have really um, have really been pretty good here lately. And and that is interesting when you talk about practice. And and, and this is a good question that I don't think the audience knows yet. You're, you're a Smith Mountain local, correct? Yes, sir. So with that in mind, that you're not traveling six hours to fish it, do mm-hmm. you? When you have your local body of water, that's where you also like to fun fish. But when you have big tournaments, how does that work into it to where it's like, I got a BFL in a week, probably shouldn't be out there smoking them. So do you, do you have to tell yourself not to go out there and fish? Is it hard with how much history and, and just like, yeah, I just, I just want to get out on the body of water. Yeah, it, it does. I mean, it, 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 it changes things, I guess. For Smith, I mean, I'm constantly looking for for new new water to fish. I mean, as long as I've I've been fishing Smith, as many times as I fish Smith, I still feel like there's areas that I haven't I haven't even begun to touch yet. So, I will if I just want to go up and fun fish or or take the kids up fishing, I'll go to a completely different area of the lake to actually fish. Um, th- than what I would typically be fishing a tournament now. You know, you say that, and then if you have a smaller tournament that you're going to fish, just say a local club tournament, not with not very many boats, and you have a BFL next week, I will I will hold back on that sometimes and not fish those areas uh, that that I plan on fishing the bigger tournament at. Yeah, that, I've always found that fascinating, especially where where I am now that I have a a small body of water I can fish Thursday nighters and stuff, and it's like. Do how do I approach this throughout the week? Do I just lay off of it knowing like I kind of know the generic patterns and it's either going to work out or not, but me cruising around the lake, I'm just going to stick a bunch. Uh, but then again, you kind of get the variable of, yeah, just roll your hooks up. Um, I don't know. That is fascinating to me. Did, did you fish a lot of tournaments between the Piedmont BFL and then this one? Um, I fished, I fished, I know I fished a tournament and had 23 pounds uh, that was a cat trail tournament two weeks before this tournament. So kind of like right, right in between them. And then the week before that, I also fished another event. I think I ended up with, I don't remember what I had for that tournament. It was, it was still a decent bag and, and I, I lost a good one on that tournament too, but, um, I'm not so certain that that fish, I didn't realize it at the time when I set the hook, but I'm not so certain that that fish that I lost during that tournament wasn't spawning on the backside of a boat dock mm. because I, I skipped a jig underneath the backside of a boat dock and I didn't have any bite. I was just all of a sudden the line started swimming and I set the hook and it, it felt like a monster. And I mean, it was a good fish. Uh, it was a five plus, but it, it just fought really funny. And then it came up on this on, on its side and all of a sudden it just came off. So I don't, I, I, I think I must've had that fish hook funny probably was it was likely on a bed that i just couldn't see and you know set the hook into its side is kind of the way i thought maybe it happened but i'm not i still don't know because i never you know i didn't put the fish in the boat and i couldn't tell where i had it hooked that's insane yeah no it was it was really a good stretch you know the the end of march and 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 beginning of april had, had been a pretty good stretch for me and kind of running mostly the same water, not really the same, the same stuff really too, but the bites always came from, from different areas. Like, you know, you, you might fish, you know, you have a bunch of good stuff in this area. So you go run it and today you catch them on this rock pile and next week you're catching them on this rock pile or this rock vein or, you know, where, wherever it may be. It was like, I never caught them in the exact same spot week after week but just in the same areas how much did the eclipse and the leap year have to do with this to get all really corny and sci-fi did that affect the fish this year because it didn't seem a little wonky you know i don't know (laughs) i really don't uh, you know i just so much you know so much happened uh during the bfl I, i i really don't know it, it is interesting because that first BFL, it was absolutely piss and rain. I went down with some friends to watch them suffer. And then I was like, I'm not even going to go out and watch you guys Saturday. It's just miserable as hell. And then everyone's complaining that the BFLs are dead. No one's going to come out there. And then fast forward a month 
and it's like a full field, no problem. Uh, and, and the weather was completely different. Like going into this event, what were your thoughts in leading up to practice and the event? So my main thoughts were, uh, I was, I was watching the temperature. I was, I, that's my big thing is I was watching the water temperature. There's a Smith mountain Lake app. I was, I was checking all the, the areas, seeing what creeks looked like they were warming up faster, what area of the lake was warming up the fastest. Uh, temperature is a huge thing because once the water temperature hits, it, it used to be 62 degrees, but now it seems like 58 is a really good number for the fish to start pulling up at Smith. Um, but that being said, watching the weather up until the event, you know, the, the, those three cold days that we got right before the event, that it was brutal. It really wrecked the lake. And I was, I had a really bad practice. I was really concerned about exactly what I was going to do. Did you feel like going into it before the the front hit? I know last year, I think um, I had Cole on who won at this time last year. And there was a lot, spawning was starting to become a thing. Beds were factor, all that. Were you feeling like this was going to set up to be a a pure bed fishing slugfest? Or did you still think it was going to still be a pre-spawn? They're still trying to figure it out. I figured it'd be a mix of both. Um, you know, this year I love to throw a swim bait and, and the swim bait bite was pretty much non-existent this year. Um, yeah. it, it just jumped so fast from pre-spawn to spawn, but I, I guess I, I did. If, if the weather would have stayed on track, we would have stayed warm. We, it would have been a slug fest, but just an all out slug fest. It, it would have been fish on beds absolutely everywhere. And everybody would have caught them. Everybody would have caught them well. And, and it would have been the first the first major push. There may have been some some fish that pushed up in February. I never seen any. But, uh, I, you know, I think it certainly would have been the first major push if it would have worked out. The weather would have stayed uh, where it was supposed to be. When I practiced both Thursday and Friday, I seen more vacant beds with no, no tournament, no reason for it to be vacant. That's interesting. What there are two real thoughts it seems like, and then you know, comment section, you know, let me know uh, when this thing gets uploaded. Your thoughts, you know, thought one is if they're going to be betting, they're at the docks or the back of the coves, they're gonna, they they want to actually do the deed, and a front hits, they just kind of lock into limbo and they stay in the area, but they're just really hard to catch. Thought number two is they actually pull out and vacate a little bit more. Um, what is your thought process there? What do you think they do? Well, the fish for this tournament, they certainly, they all dropped off. And when they did, they, they, they got in a huge funk. They, they really didn't want to bite anything. Um, I think by the time practice was over, I had decided that there were, there were only, there were a couple of two pounders on beds. I mean, who wants to catch a two pounder in a BFL um, that, that were still there. But I, I had, I had one really good set of fish that was still on a bed. But other than that, everything everything had pulled off but so so what those fish did for me is they when they pulled out of the beds the the females at least they dropped off to the next piece of really like good cover uh, to me they they all went to rock all my fish ended up going to rock so any rock you could find any rock veins uh and and most of mine were, were in relation to boat docks and secondary points and those types of areas. But wherever there are typically spawners, spawning beds, spawning grounds, those fish pulled directly off and went to some rock cover pretty close by. The, the bigger females did anyways. That's interesting. Like, so if I'm in your mindset and I'm on there on a Thursday, Friday, a cold front is hit. I'm seeing a bunch of bunks. I have okay a couple of good ones on beds. My thought is I don't think it's going to take 30 pounds possibly to win it. And my strategy is going to change a little bit on a Thursday, Friday. Like, oh, this tournament's going to suck. I just need to guts and nuts 14, 16 pounds and I'll, and I'll probably be solid. Did you have that mindset when the weather was throwing these curveballs at you? There weren't big ones up that, okay, it's not, there's no way it's going to take 27 pounds. If I catch this type of limit here, I should be okay. Correct. 
So, I mean, you know, it was funny. The morning of blast off, I said I'd take I'd take 20 pounds and go home right now. <laughs> you know, somebody somebody asked me if I was on them, and that's exactly what I told them. Give me 20 pounds, and I'll go home right now. Did you say you did have a spawner on a bed the, the day before? I did. So I had I had the the big fish of of the tournament. It was uh, that one in a four and a half pounder, which I thought the the big one was a seven, but it, it wasn't locked. It wasn't necessarily locked on the seven pounder. wasn't It was just kind of swimming back and forth, and uh, you know, I, I could tell it really. I could tell it wasn't going anywhere though. You know, it had already dropped its eggs. How does that? I've always. How does that factor into your whole? mindset as an athlete it's seven it's seven plus pounds holy shit i mean clearly you're going there to start the day off right and and then does that affect you mentally to be like am i betting my whole day on this fish so the night before the tournament i get my text and i'm boat 183 and i have david williams in the boat with me who is a known stick for a co-angler and I'm like, not this guy again. Uh, you know, so <laughs> it's a couple of guys you don't want, and it's not because they're bad people. It's because they're really good anglers. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, so I knew I had him in the boat. I knew we were boat 183. I actually looked to see if any of my friends were in the top, like, 10 so that I could call them and tell them where these fish were so they could get the fish. I didn't think I would, I didn't think I would get there at boat 183. So, you know, the night before the event, it really, it really wrecked my nerves. So I was just, I was worried that other people would go straight there. So you get there, you get to that fish. How do you approach it? Like, like kind of walk us through this scene for this fish. Yeah. This is not like any other kind of betting fish that I've talked to on the show yet, where this is a big deal. This is going to solidify the bag to start off the day. So I, I start driving into the creek and as I'm headed into the creek, a boat is flying through in front of me. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, they they know where it's at. I've gotten this close, and that guy's going to get there and get on the fish. And he peels off to the bank in the riprap to the left. And I, I just peel right around to the right. And literally, I stopped. I, sh- I, I put the boat down probably 50 yards away idled up to it, um, you know, threw the trolling motor down, picked the jig up, and, you know, just made a simple skip all the way up to the bank. And I picked up on it, and as soon as I touched it, I knew I knew I had a fish on. Dude. First, first cast. And I never seen the fish in, in, until it hit the net, until he put it in the boat and he was like, how big did you say that fish was? I said, it's about seven pounds. He said, that fish is, that fish is eight pounds. And I'm like, so I throw it in the live well. I don't weigh it. I don't do anything. I just throw it in the live well. Um, I circle around and I figured the other fish had seen the the jig. So I was going to throw the drop shot. So I circle around, I throw the drop shot over there. First cast, the fish picks it up. I set the hook. It comes up out of the water, jumps out of the water, and comes off. So um, I, I figured that the four pounder was four and a half pounder was a lost cause. Well, I uh, threw, threw another drop shot worm on, threw back over there, and it ate it again on the third cast. So first, second, and third cast, I had a bite. And the first and third, I put uh, a little over 12 and a half pounds in the boat uh, off of two fish mentally where are you at right now and how hard is it to actually like maintain and still follow a plan i guess it, it definitely threw me off my plan because my original plan was to run up up you know up the roanoke past the bridge was was my initial plan and like that that's where i wanted to end up at some point throughout the day i was going to run over into credit creek and, and fish around over there a little bit. And then I was going to make my make my run up the Roanoke and spend the rest of my day up there because I had a late check-in until 5 o'clock. And I, I thought I could catch, you know, a pretty good bag of fish up there. But, you know, when I put that fish in the boat, both of those fish in the boat, and, I mean, I, I literally knew I only needed three more fish. 
uh, and I, I have some really good areas, you know, that, that I've fished for years. Um, so I knew I could, I knew I could catch a, a decent three fish. I had no idea it would be, you know, the quality of the rest of the three that I caught. Um, but you know, that started me off, that started me off pretty good. And, and I never, I never weighed those fish when I left that spot. I went to one more area, uh, and, and fish the end of a lay down tree and that I, that I like to fish, um, out in, it, it sits in about 20 foot of water. So I, I fished that just to see if anything was there. And, and the only, the thing that was on my mind is how big is that fish? How actually, how big is those two fish? So after I fished that area, I did go ahead and weigh both of those fish and, and figure out that, you know, the one was an eight pounder and the other one was a four. And a Jesus, man. Wait, when you open up a Bassmaster magazine, they talk about the best spawning baits for bed fish. Usually the jig is not the first go. Um, there's a lot of finesse stuff nowadays people use. So why did you start with a jig and not like a, a Bitsy tube or a Ned rig or a white worm or something like that? Well, I knew exactly, I knew exactly where those fish were. I knew exactly where the bed was. Uh, the white bait is primarily, is primarily so you can see the bait and how the fish reacts to the bait. It was, it was still dark enough first thing in the morning. Like I knew that wasn't going to be the issue. And pro the way I, I typically bid fish is maybe different than the way some people do. I, I don't try to see it. Like I don't watch it. I don't try to watch it go down. I, I try to make long casts. I've had way more success catching bidding fish from a distance rather than actually watching them eat the bait. I just, I try to make as long of a cast as I possibly can and hope like heck they eat it as soon as I throw it in there. And a lot of times they will. Do you turn off all your electronics when you're starting to get in that creep mode? I, I pretty much had my electronics either off or on pause all day long. Interesting. Yep. Was now, were, was your whole, now, was your whole day based on spawning fish or was that just because you were fishing shallow or, or what? I was, I was fishing shallow. Okay. Yeah. Very. Um, no, I, th that was the only two fish that, that I caught on the bed all day long. Wow. Yep. Was that by choice? Um, it was, I mean, I, I would have loved to have had some other areas that, that had bigger fish it just wasn't, it, they just weren't there. I mean, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't to be had. You couldn't, you couldn't have, if, if I would have went spawn fishing the rest of the day, uh, I would have came in with 18 pounds. You know, I would have caught, I, I'm, I may have had 19 or 20, you know, two, two, two and a half, two and three quarter would have been about the biggest fish I could have caught, uh, spawning besides those two. When you mention, you know, Craddock Creek and, and running all the way up the Roanoke River, um, especially like the Roanoke, you're dealing with a completely different type of water clarity. Is that by design that you, you wanted to eventually get up to that dirtier water? Um, Do you feel somewhat. more comfortable there, like fishing, if you had your druthers? I, you know, I probably feel more comfortable fishing the clear water, if I'm being honest. Um that's just something that I've, I've done. And I, I, I feel like some of the biggest fish in the lake are in the clearer water. Um, but you know, I think for myself, I, I'll be, I'll be right on the bank one minute fishing, fishing right on the bank with all my electronics off. And, you know, 10 minutes later, I'll be out, you know, fishing 30 and 40 foot of water. I, I don't really, I, I don't really, I guess I don't really pay attention to that stuff very much. I, I have kind of my spots laid out and things that I plan on fishing and, and kind of go based on that. And, and really the main reason for that wanting to go up was I just, I knew I had such a long day and I, I felt like those fish up there hadn't been tormented quite as much. I knew in practice, I seen a lot of people roaming the banks uh, in, the, in the more clear water to see if they could find spawners. So basically it was, I really feel like they're going to stay down late because they're beating up bed fish. I have a hunch that they're not going to be molested as much up there. So let's try to make that interesting. Okay. I like that idea. Huh? 
Yeah, and that's something you can't practice for, you know? That that is an in-game decision that you've seen where the boats go. And you listen to like a John Cox when he does stuff and he literally just drives across state lines to fish a tournament and he just looks around and he's like, well, there's nobody over here, so I'm going to go there because they're not pressured. And you can't practice for that because that's that boat pressure situation that is is such a big variable nowadays. All right. So the weird thing was is after catching those two fish, I go over into Credit Creek and I have a spot of hydrilla that it grows every year. And I don't know why, but it's about the size of the front deck of the boat. We don't, we're not a grass lake. We don't have much grass at all, but it's a spot of hydrilla. It's about the size of the front front deck of my boat. It grows every year. It starts in March, early March, maybe even late February, depending on the weather. And, and it grows until I, I guess until the grass carp eat it. And it's, it's usually gone by June. Hmm. So I don't know why, but my, my next, when I came down to Credit Creek, my, my first cast was into that hydrilla patch and I'm, I just got the jig sitting in the hydrilla patch. It's in 10 foot of water and I know exactly where it is. I didn't have to use live scope. All my electronics are still off at this point and I'm just kind of, I'm just letting it soak. And I honestly went to lift the jig out of the grass patch just to get it back to the boat. And I, I felt weight. I set the hook. The fish didn't fight at all. It was crazy. Uh, David nets that boat and uh, nets that boat, nets that fish. I put it in the boat. And in my mind, I was thinking that that was like a three and a halfer. Um, threw it in the live well, never weighed it. And I went and caught another fish that was a 275. And I said, well, while I'm, weigh- while I'm weighing this one, I may as well weigh the other fish that I caught so I can see what my actual weight is now. And when I put the fish on the scale, it was a five pounder. Um, so it was just like, it didn't fight. And I'm thinking it's a three and a half. And even, even at weigh-in, I still do not understand that. that I guess it's bone structure must've been bigger. It, I mean, it had a good size jaw on it, but I, the fish didn't look like a five pounder to me. And I, I, it just, it just shocked me that it was a five. I mean, when it's your time, it's your time. Like I keep, I keep hearing that when I have winners on, it's like, you just, you can't do anything wrong and, and you make a couple of decisions. Um, like, but you kept with the jig. And I, I guess part of it actually is like, once you have that nice big ass kicker, did you mm-hmm. think ever about just rolling a mag draft or these big glides? Cause that's what everybody does nowadays to catch another one or, or, or like what was your thought to say? Like, I'm just going to stick with this. So the, the jig has been really good to me this year. It's been horrible. So, <laughs> it, but I had, I had done that damage with the jig and I, I don't know. I went, I went into another Creek and caught like a four and some change on the jig. So, I mean, that put me at 20, I had 23 pounds at 11 o'clock, 10 45 or 11 o'clock, 23 pounds. And at that, that's, that's when I thought that I had a 275 to get rid of. And that is honestly when I thought I should go throw the mag draft the rest of the day. That was in my mind. Uh, but also like, just from what I had found throughout the day was exactly what I said. Like I got like 30 key areas and the fish seemed to have pulled off of those when they, when they pulled back because of the cold weather, they went to rock. So any isolated rock I could find, I was, I was catching a a pretty good fish off of it, whether it be, like I said, most of it wasn't under boat docks because they, the fish were seeking rock and sun. So if you could find, if you could find rock and if it was in the sunshine, it's like, it was almost a guarantee to be a fish there. When you mean uh, rock, are we talking mm-hmm. just rock veins on the shore that you're visually seeing, or these are just waypoints of like rock piles? It's, it's, it's waypoints of areas that I know where rock is. One, the, the very last fish I caught, uh, with the six pounder it's a rock vein that runs underneath a boat dock and i actually fished under the boat dock i made five casts under the boat dock and i had backwashed the dock i mean i was within probably and i you know i'm that's another thing when i fish i like 
I always say I'm hunting. You know, I, I fish like I'm hunting. I try to be quiet. I try not to prop wash. I believe in not having your electronics make a lot of noise. Uh, and that that particular dock, I got entirely too close to it. So I prop washed the entire rock vein, but the rock vein still comes out the side of the boat dock. And I, I cast over there to the rock vein that, that was in the sun and worked the jig back and like the six cast, you know, wow. and, and the six pounder actually smoked it. And once I got that one in the boat and weighed it, I knew that I knew it was, I, I knew if somebody beat me, it, it, they had a heck of a good day. And I was honestly, at that point, I was pretty well satisfied. Uh, I with, mean, with, did, did you feel like you had big fish at least? Like, did you think someone was gonna catch a nine? It, I did. <laughs> I, you know, Smith has been been chunk, chunking them out, and I I forget what the weight was in that tournament last year. I had either caught, I don't want to lie, but I I swear it was an eight sixty four is the is what I caught last year in this exact tournament for big fish. Um, so I knew it was certainly possible for somebody to catch one bigger, and and I I didn't realize I. I I knew it would be close, but I, I remember telling David I'll probably be second or third on big fish. I felt like somebody would probably catch one bigger. Dude, I mean, you had a hell of a tournament. Um, I mean, again, 27 plus pounds to win this thing. Uh, a really nice chunk of change. Did you feel like if somebody was going to beat you, were they going to beat you kind of doing what you're doing, running shallow patterns, rock and spawn? Or do you think it was going to be someone deep on either, you know, standing timber, things like that? I, I honestly, I figured that somebody may have went up the river and in practice, when I went up the river, it was clear all the way to Indian. So I felt, which is, you know, a good ways and you usually aren't clear that far up. So I figured somebody would have went up river where it stayed warmer. The, the water temperature wasn't as, as affected quite as much as, as it was on the lower end. And I figured somebody would have went up and caught some spawners up that direction. And and if 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 I were if I were gonna lose, that's how I figured they would do it. But I'll be honest with you when 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 I put when I put that fish on the scale and it was a six pounder and I think my uh, Rapala scale said twenty seven twenty two, I knew like yeah. I I didn't want to be cocky about it, but I mean, I mean dude, I, come on, yeah, <laughs> one thirty. I, I put my rod sleeves on all my rods. I put all my rods up and I asked my co-angler where you want to go. It was he, he needed, he needed fish. And, uh, he was very patient behind me all day. And he said he knew he would get his chance. And, uh, you know, I, I, I he didn't, he said, wherever you think I can go catch some fish, <laughs> you know? So I took him into a couple of areas and I had my, I, I, I had my six, my six fish at one thirty. Had my twenty seven pounds, and by two thirty, he was culling. So, Damn. yeah. So he, he in an hour he had caught caught his limit and was culling, and he ended up finishing thirteenth. So he was he was pretty happy with that because he he initially came into it just wanting to catch one fish. Dude, that's freaking awesome. Um, so when you're skipping a jig, I mean, what what is your setup like? Are you using some of those like $6,000 Japanese reels and, and some fluorocarbon you can only buy on the sun? Like what, what, what is your setup like? Yeah. I, so I use a Shimano, one of the Shimano DC reels. Um, I like those. I, I don't know that they actually help you skip any better without backlash. And you know, if you're going to backlash, you're still going to backlash. Um, and honestly, I have a old falcon jason christie special that i bought from walmart it's like a flipping a flipping jig rod that i have i paid 50 bucks for it it was on clearance for half price and i have spent like 500 dollars repairing that rod uh, over the years just it it is i don't know what it is about it i've tried to find them on ebay i've tried to find them everywhere i cannot find that rod um but it, it's it's a pretty special rod, especially for me. And and it it's got probably more backbone than most people would use for a jig rod, since it is a, a flipping you know flipping rod. But it's 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 pretty good. And then uh, you know typically for myself, I'm I'm 
I'm skipping with 20 pound sniper. Um, just jig in general is 20 pound sniper for me. And that's mainly because I've thrown 15, I've thrown 17. I have a really bad habit of putting my thumb on the spool when I set the hook and you will break fish off every time if you don't have thick enough line. Hmm. That's interesting. Have you ever like seen these, like, um, these stretch tests they do now with fluorocarbon and they really show you that all fluorocarbon stretches a little bit. And I guess with that said, have you ever thought about using mono, the newer mono now, just to have that kind of stretch so you can adjust the, the size? I haven't. Um, I guess, I guess I'm kind of on the don't broke. If it's not broke, don't fix it type of deal. And I, I, I know I throw a jig so much and that broad and i always throw a rage crawl like i think you know if my if my if my pincher on my crawl if, if my pincher on my rage crawl isn't swimming exactly right i know it like i i'm just so in tune to it at this point i throw it so much i yeah, I can't. I, I really didn't. I really don't want to switch up anything that I'm doing. That's that's why I've spent so much money fixing that rod. It's just, it's 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 been really good to me. How do you know when to throw a chatterbait versus like a swim jig profile? I, I feel like everybody, because you know, I live up near the Potomac, and if you don't have a chatter six chatterbaits on, people think you're crazy. But the swim jig for me has always been this just silent thing that works so much better in a lot of situations. Yeah, I mean, on Smith Mountain, people throw chatterbaits. I'm not uh, – matter of fact, the, the tournament before this one, people were catching them on chatterbaits. That was a, that was a, big, a big way to catch them in the, uh, the nasty rain and, you know, everything we had. I'm, I don't throw a chatterbait that much. I, I just don't. Um, I'll pick it up every now and then. Even when I go to the Potomac – I'm typically throwing a jig or a drop shot or something like that. I mean, when I first started fishing the Potomac, it hadn't been very, very many times, but I, my, my very first memory of the Potomac was I, I went down there and I, my, my intention was to throw all moving baits, chatter baits, swim jigs, and I was just going to go have a great day. I was going to jack fish and – I end up throwing a drop shot and I'm like, man, I can throw a drop shot at home at Smith mountain. What in the world am I doing throwing a drop shot at the Potomac? But that was the only way I could catch them. I mean, mm -hmm. that was the way to catch those fish from, from, for myself. And I was even with people that fished the Potomac and I was catching drop shot fish out of the grass. So I, you know, I, I know there's a time and a place for it, but I just have more confidence with the, uh, drop shot jig and stuff like that. And, and I, I, I fished the Potomac totally different than the locals do, obviously anyways, but no, that, that is really insightful. Cause yeah, it's so the chatterbait cult is so interesting. I, I, I selfishly, I suck with the chatterbait and maybe it's just, I don't give it its due, but the kid keeps catching fish. I, I look, I keep telling myself this stock is going to go down at some point and sure enough, it doesn't, it keeps going the other damn way. So I don't know, maybe they'll just always hit the stupid thing. I think they probably will, honestly. What else do you have coming up this year? Um, I mean, you got the you got this massive win under your belt. Are you going to fish the rest of the Shenandoah division? Like, what's your vibe for the rest of the year? Yeah, my initial plan was to fish the rest of them. Um, I, I I think I'm going to continue to roll with that, you know. And and if unless I do really bad in one, you know, and and it looks like I'm pushed out, I've I've won the Angler of the Year. Um, twice now so if i can keep that run going i will continue to do that if it, if i have a bad event and it looks like it falls off i may use my win and you're in for the regional that was my main goal this year was to qualify for the regional on uh bugs island Kerr lake so as long as i, I know i'm there so since i won the one all i gotta do is pay my entry fees and fish one more so we'll, we'll see how that goes my goal would be to fish them all what is your vibe? Because the schedule for the Shenandoah division is now title, uh, title everywhere you can look. Now you've won the Angler of the Year a couple of times, so yeah, title doesn't bother you, right? I mean, or I mean, where do you feel like with the James and the Potomac? Is one more like daunting compared to the other? Not, not 
Not really. I feel like I have more stuff that I can fish at the Potomac than I do the James. Uh, a lot of times at the Potomac, I will go to D.C. I have a couple of stuff, you know, a couple of things in the Occoquan where I'll run into there, too. But a lot of times I'll go to the, uh, go to D.C. when I'm at the Potomac. Um, and, and, you know, I always say that I absolutely despise the Potomac. You know, the weather sucks. Most of the times it's windy. It's bumpy. But I have actually done quite well at the Potomac. It, I, I say I hate it, but it likes me. So that's 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 kind of the vibe that I carry with the Potomac. And then the James River has probably been the biggest thorn in my side as far as a a, a body of water that that I just can't seem to to figure out. Yeah. You know, everybody wants to make the run to the chick and I've made the run to the chick. I've called them in the chick. I I, I had a I had a top 10 down there last year. It was, you know, it was it was okay, but the the the, the, Pot- the Potomac definitely treats me better than the James. The, the, the James is a, I don't know, I don't, I really don't know what to say about it. I just can't quite put my finger on it or figure it out. Yeah, um, they're tough. different. They're so freaking different. And the Potomac, I've always told it to people that that ask for information from me. It's like people like to complicate how simple it is. It's mm-hmm. super simple, and we try to make it way too complicated. The the James, it's like the current rips a little bit harder. It's not really grass based. It's more dock cypress based. Even though there is some grass, but it's just a little different. And I, I kind of get get your vibe there. Um, yeah, you can milk run there a lot more. It seems like than the Potomac, where camping you can get you can do real well camping in a creek on the Potomac. I think compared to the James. Yeah. And, and I do have a couple of places that I'll run to at the James that can be really good, especially when the buzz bait time is going. Um, yeah, I remember, I remember I went into this one Creek one time and you actually had to jump a log to get in there. And I jumped the log, I get in and I start throwing the buzz bait and it was just ridiculous of how many fish I caught. It was like those fish in that Creek had never seen a buzz bait before a day in their life. And it was a tiny Creek. Um, so, so I've had, I've had some, some decent days there, but really I think I've probably fished, I've probably only fished the James, I don't, less than 10 times I've had, I've had two top 10 finishes. So I, I guess I, I shouldn't complain too much, but, uh, I've also had some bombs there as well. <laughs> what does it take to be, to do the angler of the year thing? I mean, the consistency wise, is it, is it a mindset of just going out there and, and, batting for a high average or did you just swing for the fence a couple of times and you connected on the ball every time? So for me, it's, it's just all about consistency. That's, that's probably, you know, I, I'm not a huge, like go out and let's go out and win this tournament. Obviously winning pays a lot more. Uh, but, but I think for myself, it's like, let me go out and get a, get a, get a limit and then I'll, I'll work up from there. And just just trying to be consistent, and and that's all it is about for the angler. You you can't bomb a tournament. If you bomb a tournament, it's it's too many guys out there that can catch them, and they will. And you know, so you just can't you just can't bomb it. You know, you about the worst you you want to finish. Probably those angler of the year tournaments. I would have I would expect probably in the in the twenties is as as low as I finished in those years. You want to be somewhere in the top 20. Because it's so interesting that you mentioned the drop shot. And every guy that I know that really likes to finesse stuff, he usually does well when it comes to points at the end of the year. He might not always win, but damn, he's always he's always at top. How did you foster that kind of like, I guess, finesse mindset? Because a, a lot of guys I've had on the show wouldn't go to a Ned rig, a drop shot, some finesse shit right away. Yeah, so probably just being on Smith mountain, you know, that huh. clear water and pre live scope, uh, going out and fishing areas that, that I knew held fish. And that's just, it's quite frankly, the only bait that I could get them to bite, you know, was, was the drop shot. Um, I, I would say fishing Smith mountain definitely, fostered all of the drop shot finesse type fishing tactics that I have. What's your drop shot setup 
Is it Shimano? Uh, so it's weird. I throw, you know, I throw different stuff completely, hmm. but, um, so for that, my rod, I'll, I'll either throw, uh, you know, the, one of the Gary Loomis edge rods okay. or my buddy, Brian Warfel has made me a couple of, they're on the same blanks. They're the North Fork composite blanks, uh, the drop shot blanks. And then he, he makes me a really nice rod, uh, that works really good for the drop shot. It's super like if you, if you played with it, you'd be like, man, I, if you called a, a, a three pounder, you'd have a tough time getting it in. You would think so is as, as limber as the rod is. It's it's, but I mean, it's got, it's called some big ones. It, it you, you don't have any problems with them. Um, and then as far as a reel is concerned, I, I switch around a lot, but, um, if, if I had to, to, to name one, I, you know, I'm a fan of the, uh, I'm a fan of the president, uh, reels, man. You can get those for under a hundred bucks and they, uh, they do the job pretty good for, for a reel that's under a hundred bucks. That's awesome. Chris, I, I really can't, I appreciate so much you giving some time to come on the show. Um, is there any sponsors that we can help promote for you? Yeah. Uh, so Cabela's short pump has, uh, been with me since, um, let me think what year was that? 2021, I think was the first year. Um, that was the year I, I won angler of the year. So, um, Definitely Cabela Short Pump, and you know my my wife is probably my biggest sponsor, my family. Um, but you know, any 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 person, any man, any woman, anybody who fishes in general, and uh, they they do it and do it at a high level. They definitely have a a good spouse if they are indeed married, or even a boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever. Somebody's got somebody's got got to got to stay at home and take care of things while the other one's out having fun. And, uh, you know, I got, I, I, my wife is like, she's super supportive. I can't, I couldn't do half of what I do without her being so supportive. Well, yeah. Huge shout out to all the spouses there and congratulations on getting brownie points that she's in the background. That's always a good thing. She uh, went to get, <laughs> <laughs> dude. Um, yeah, Chris, again, thank you so much. You're more than welcome to always come back on the show. Uh, as always, guys, link in the episode description to, about everything that we talked about this evening, of course, including all of his social media and his links to all of his sponsors. Please go check them out. And then also a link to everyone that helps us keep this show running. Go check us out on Patreon. Uh, we're getting close to our next goal, which is 200, so we can launch a website to make things a little bit better as we keep going towards our overall goal of starting a nonprofit so we can help start supplementing stocking some of these lakes in Virginia and Maryland. Like and subscribe to the channel, and we'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.